We're extremely pleased to have uh, Doug Gansler here. He's a partner in the DC office of Buckley Sandler, and he uh, draws on more than 20 years of public advocacy and leadership. Um, he brings a unique perspective to client matters in financial services, healthcare, pharmaceutical, insurance, telecom, and other consumer-centric industries. And uh, prior to joining Buckley Sandler, Mr. Gansler held numerous public positions, including Attorney General of Maryland, President of NAAG, Montgomery County State's Attorney, and Assistant U.S. Attorney. And we're, you know, uh, he's been an outspoken um, expert on uh, on auto, uh, the auto sector, and we're very happy to have him. Please uh, give uh, Mr. Doug Gansler a round of applause. <clears throat> Keynote, I think, means last, um, right? I think you're finished with this after the, my, my remarks. And um, I do need to get out of here about 15, 20 minutes because I'm flying, uh, catching a plane. So I had my most recent experience in this um, realm yesterday, a late afternoon yesterday, and my mother uh, called me and she said, I don't think I just did something right. My mother's 82 and she's a typical Jewish mother, so she's calling me up and and she says, um, I get, just gave someone my credit card number on the telephone. I said, why did you do that? And she said, well, he told me my, my car warranty was going to expire by the end of today if I didn't uh, give him my number and do a monthly bill where they're going to charge me $78 a month forever. I said, and, he, and I said, do you know this person? Well, he gave me his name. I said, I promised you that wasn't his name. So we had to go through the credit card. Uh, we called the credit card company, canceled her credit card. It was the first time that happened. And, and you know, when I was Attorney General of, of Maryland, this was the area that we were most focused on in the auto specter, which was absolutely nothing to do with cars. It was actually just scams around cars and made people feel bad. Uh, it actually hurts the auto industry, if you look at it as a whole, because these people have nothing to do with the auto industry. They're just trying to take advantage of people, and they get the information from them, and they got my 82-year-old mother. So, um, so that's a, is a, a one place that, that really AGs were more focused than the federal government. So I'm, I'm supposed to speak for a few minutes about the difference between state AGs and the federal government. And, and you know, we are getting, when I say we, I was, uh, I, it's been about a year and a half, almost a, a little over a year, that I was an AG, but I still have that hat on and I can do that today. Um, I'm also getting older and I also forget, so I'm gonna become a lawyer pretty soon. But for now, um, I still have that AG hat. So I can tell you some of the things that we were looking at that were very different than the federal government. Um, but I can also say this, the CFPB is sort of the biggest uh, player in the federal space. And the relationship between the state AGs and the CFPB is about as close as any relationship I've ever seen with state government and federal government. And a lot of that has to do with Director Cordray being one of us. He was the Attorney General of Ohio uh, prior to becoming the director of the CFPB. In fact, he was my mentee when he was there, which was, I thought was somewhat ironic. He actually, um, little known fact about Director Cordray, he won the um, uh, Jeopardy five straight times, and then they threw him off because that's all you're allowed to win five times at, the, at that time. Uh, the FTC is obviously a big player as well. So where the state AGs have traditionally been most involved and will continue to be most involved will be in the UDAP space. Um, are, they, they will always look at um, the, this industry as a, as a whole, and I'm talking about the finance companies, the, the manufacturers, the dealers, um, through the eyes of the consumer. And that's uh, how AGs will operate. Um, the cynic would say the consumers are also called voters, and 43 of the 50 have to get elected, and the other have to be politically accountable. So they're going to take care of their, their citizens. So the UDAP uh, statute, are, is it deceptive? I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about this when I was walking over here um, after I parked my car. When, uh, uh, when I was younger, there were a zillion ads about, you know, the, like the kind of crazy Eddie ads, but for cars. You know, just buy this and come on in, we'll give you free cars and you don't have to pay anything and don't worry about it and you'll be happy. Um, you don't really see those ads as much anymore. Now they just have, you know, models driving cars through mountains and you're supposed to go in and buy your car because you'll get that model and you'll be driving in a mountain. Um, and so there, there's been a really, I think the, the pressure of state AGs has actually uh, really curbed the industry quite well over time. Um, 
but then we're talking about, and I think this conference is focused on subprime auto loans. So the word subprime will wake up even the, the oldest of state AGs. They'll kind of they'll sit up in the chair. And that whenever you're dealing with subprime issues, AGs get very involved. I was actually, as was mentioned, I was president of NAG, the National Association, in 2012 to 2013, when we went through the national mortgage foreclosure crisis. And I think in the wake of that is when uh, AG started to turn their focus on, well, what other, you know, the house is the biggest thing you have. What's the next biggest thing? Well, cars. And now the, the, there are finance companies that are giving subprime loans. Maybe we ought to look into that. And so they have. Um, and they've looked at sort of how are car companies and how are finance companies targeting subprime loans? Is it, is it done the right way? Is it, is it deceptive? Are they telling people what they're going to get? How quickly do they do that? What's some of the five-finger fan thing I just saw? That was clever. Um, but how, how does that happen? You know, when you buy a house and the, the stack of papers is this big, maybe the ones for cars are this big. And is, or does the consumer know, in fact, what he or she is getting? And are they fully informed about what they, they are buying? And do they know what they're buying when they buy it? And, you know, and, and there's always this sort of friction uh, between you know, people are smart enough to know what they're getting into and they're, they're supposed to be informed. And, and the, the notion that, well, not everybody comes to that table equally equipped and equally sophisticated to have a, an understanding of that. So um, I think so. Those, that's sort of the, the issue. They haven't really. You know, I would just say New England, I guess. New York, Delaware, Massachusetts have been the most aggressive state AGs in this space. Um, Maryland, we, we, we got aggressive on some issues and some other issues we didn't when I was there, and they're still pretty an aggressive um, AG's office. I'm a Democrat. I should sort of give them your bias. I'm a moderate Democrat. And it's the Democrats that tend to be the most aggressive uh, in this space. Um, and so in the New England states are, for the most part, all Democratic uh, AG's, if not all, as I think about it. Um, so what what uh, what do I sort of see? And I'll just wrap this up in the next couple of minutes. So I'll do questions. But what I see is sort of some of the issues. I I took extensive notes sitting outside. Um, so I'll tell you what I as I what I was thinking about when I was sitting in the chair out there, about what AGs where I see AGs coming down more in the in the near uh, coming years. I think they're going to as more of these finance companies become um, inextricably tied to the dealers um, and they're called you know Honda or BMW or whatever the, the, there's there's some um, possibility that AGs will think consumers get confused about that uh, are, who are they actually getting their loan from um, and so I think they're going to want to see the finance companies monitor the dealers a little bit more closely have that relationship be um, much more where put the onus on the on the finance company to make sure the dealers are actually telling the people what it is they need to be told. Uh, you're going to see continued scrutiny, I believe, on aftermarket products. Um, the one that seems to get the most attention is a product called Gap in Massachusetts. Um, but there are certainly other, you know, extended warranties is always going to be an issue. Um, and that's the extended warranties is where the, the shysters that go after my mother then sort of play on as well. And what that is and what that is not, and is that a good deal for consumers? And do consumers feel like they have to buy it? Is it is it a mandatory kind of thing? Fair lending, you know, there's the Federal Fair Lending Act, obviously, and I think that there are state. Uh, you're going to continue, especially uh, Eric uh, General Snyderman up in New York uh, is is going to continue to look at fair lending statutes. Are the are there using state discrimination laws? Um, you'll see more and more, to the extent there are civil rights divisions. I started the first civil rights division in Maryland um, that they'd ever have had, and not many states at that time really have civil rights divisions, but to the extent they do, and New York does, you'll, see, you'll start seeing some of the CIDs and subpoenas coming from the civil rights division instead of consumer protection divisions of the AG's office as they look into this idea of discriminatory lending going forward. Um, and the, the last one is the biggest um, one where I think you're going to continue to see AGs because um, I go to, I still, my practice involves st state AGs, so I represent companies that uh, confront issues with state AGs quite often. And so I go to all the DAGA meetings, RAGA meetings, that's the Democratic Attorney General, Republican Attorney General, CWAG, Conference of Western Attorneys General, and NAG, 
which is National Association of Attorneys General, which some people think of as National Association of Aspiring Governors. And I go to all their meetings, and one of the biggest issues, literally on every, every single meeting, every conference, there's a panel on debt collection. And so I think you're gonna to continue to see debt collection and sort of the repossession of vehicles and what they're being resold as to, to, to cut against the debt. I think you're gonna see those issues continue to, um, to grow on the state side as well as CFPB. So with that, I'd like to subside and get in, take any questions, thoughts, or you can go eat the food in the back, whatever you want to do. Do you see um, uh, the, the CFPB um, and the state AG, can you talk a little bit more about that relationship? It, it's a close one, and, and so does the CFPB look, you know, share information and vice versa? And what, what, what's, the, what's the effect of, of that partnership? So the CFPB and the age, state AGs literally have a portal that shares information. Uh, 28 states actively use it. Uh, the rest are encouraged to use it. And so each, whether you're Republican, Democrat, West, East, North, South, whatever you are, the, the engine of every state AG's office is the Consumer Protection Division. So the Consumer Protection Chiefs have a call all the time. They do multi-states together. Um, they, they just had a conference a week ago Monday here in D.C. They get together and talk about issues. The CFPB is part of that conversation, whether they're, they're sometimes physically on the call, but often there, there's, there's direct communication between the two. Um, and they'll often decide... One will take the lead on a case, and the, the, in the state AGs take the lead, and the CFPB will shadow it, or vice versa. Um, often they'll come in at the end and, and sort of have a joint resolution to a particular problem that has co uh, concurrent jurisdiction. Uh, how that will play out over time is anybody's guess. I mean, the CFPB is a relatively new agency. I mean, you, you go to RAGA conferences, they're, they're, they talk about how they shouldn't be a CFPB. They're like, they're, they'll literally have an hour talking about how they should get rid of the CFPB, which obviously is not going to happen. The focus probably should be on reforming and how they want to reform it, but they talk about getting rid of it. Uh, it's here to stay, but they're still, that said, they're still trying to flex their muscles. The CFPB is still trying to figure out who they are and what they are. I remember when I first started at my law firm a year ago, we were in a meeting and one of, somebody said, well, the CFPB doesn't have jurisdiction to do that. If that's your defense, you're in trouble because they think they have jurisdiction to do most anything. And so they're still sort of uh, sowing their oats, figuring out who they are as an organization. What will be interesting is, uh, you know, someday Rich Cordray will no longer be the director and how and if the CFPB changes its focus and direction will be of some interest. And, but for right now, that relationship is very, very, very close. Well, well, both. I mean, see, I, what I was saying was to the extent, not every, every AG's office has a consumer protection division. Not every AG's office has a civil rights division. In fact, the, the minority of offices have a civil rights division. Those offices that do will look at issues like, are there car dealerships in underserved areas before you even get to who's financing it? Uh, and to the extent there are, uh, either in those neighbor areas or in uh, affluent areas, are the... Are the interest rates being uh, the same to minorities versus others? Um, are, are there access to, to financing for, for minorities? And, all, and there's just a different focus there coming from the Civil Rights Division than you might have from the Consumer Protection Division was the point I was trying to make. All right, everybody's happy? You've been sitting here sweating all morning? All right. Well, thank you for, for having me. I'll hang around for a few minutes if anyone has any personal problems they want to get off their chest. But otherwise, <laughs> thanks for, uh, for including me this morning.